Welcome back to But We're Different. For those of you joining us for the first time, But We're Different Live is a sales and marketing show for revenue professionals who want to think differently about growing their businesses and adapt to the not so hidden, but commonly ignored changes happening in the marketplace. Unlike other shows about sales and marketing that chase trends, we focus only on reinforcing the foundational sales and marketing principles that everyone else neglects. We here at Impact have a team of coaches and trainers that are at any given time working with over 75 companies, helping them close the trust gap and master the principles of they ask, you answer. Everything we share with you in these sessions is what we see firsthand from the companies that we work with. I promise you this, you will always leave with actionable takeaways that you can immediately implement whatever your role is in your organization. Thanks everybody for joining us today. We know there's many ways you could be spending this hour, but the fact that you spend it with us means a lot to us. So let's get into it. All right. So we need to set a few things straight here first. I love salespeople. I was in sales for almost seven years and this is not calling out salespeople, but somewhere along the way, we lost our way. So to give some context here, there's new research from Nevada and Chili Piper that shows that 35% of legitimate demo requests are never responded to. And 21% of demo requests take more than two days to get a response. And for the sales conversations that do take place, there's research from Gong that shows the salespeople talk on average 70% of the time. So if we're talking that much, we're not learning about the buyer, we're not learning about the problem they're trying to solve, and we're not learning where they are in their decision-making process. And so it's with stats like this, it is no mystery as to why fewer and fewer people are raising their hands to talk to sales. So today, we work to change this. It is possible for buyers to actually look forward to these conversations because it moves them closer to making a decision and it moves them closer to solving a problem. But in order to do this, we need to rethink the way we communicate in sales conversations. Buyers want someone to help guide them towards a decision. And that's what today's all about. So Zach, get us started here. How are salespeople expected to talk less, but close more deals? Yeah. And I appreciate getting ahead of the fact that although we might talk about what's broken in sales today, we love salespeople here at Impact. I work with them every single day. I am one. And just the way that we attack marketing trends that don't make any sense, we should be attacking sales trends that don't make any sense as well. The fact of the matter is, a lot of us will say something at some point in our life, which is that I don't like salespeople. And when we say that, it's not that we don't like them as people, it's that we don't like being manipulated. We don't like being sold to, which is crazy that we say that, by the way, because when we say we don't want to be sold to, that's actually exactly what we want. We just want somebody to help us make a decision, not manipulate us in some way. A classic example of this, a lot of people say, use car salesmen as, as like a, a, an example of a poor buying experience. And what we would often think of is that like sleazy, smarmy person who doesn't care about our interests at all. They, they tend to know everything about these vehicles, right? They could tell you everything about how it's great for everybody, but they're not actually helping you to make a great decision for yourself. Now, which by the way, I've worked with many that have helped me make a good decision. They just have a bad rap in that industry. But Nick, to your question, how are salespeople expected to talk less and close more deals? Well, the fact is, if we're doing all the talking, if we're doing a bunch of pitching, there's not enough self-discovery that's happening on the side of our buyers and our prospects. If you think about self-discovery through these, through these lenses, Um, An example of this might be, you know, let's say you're you're talking with a loved one and you're dealing with some sort of problem. You you take that problem to them and they tell you, well, this is what you should do versus asking you, what do you think you should do? Now, if they tell you what to do, the likelihood of you doing that thing, being fully committed to it and actually making a change is much smaller. Would you agree? Versus when they say, well, what do you think you should do? Now they're having you think about the situation. You might discover the solution for yourself and therefore how committed and, and likely are you to make a change after that? Well, it's, much, it's much greater. 
problem is it's not how we've been taught how to do sales for so many of us. We might be taught to ask discovery questions, but prompting self-discovery is a totally different thing. But we've all been on that other side of the sales conversation before where the salesperson starts asking those questions and you're like, they're scoping, they're looking for a wedge, they're they're looking for something to just create a case. And so I think I've done this and I think a lot of people have done this, which is you hear those questions come through and you're one word answering people. So how do you get people to actually talk? That's why salespeople talk 70% of the time is because they ask questions and all, and they're not getting any feedback. Well, I'd love to hear Will's thoughts on this too, but my, my, my uh, thing is when, when you're asking uh, discovery questions that get a one word response, or they almost seem irritating to the prospect it's because in their mind, there was not a true purpose of the question and it's not going to help us make progress. It might help you write down some little things on your sheet, but for me, it's not helping me make progress and it doesn't have a purpose for me in this moment. The prospect must feel as though the questions that we are asking are helping them progress and move forward. There's a true purpose in doing it. That's the key with how we, we, we phrase our questions and how we want to go and, and, and use questions to prompt self-discovery. Will? Yeah, <clears throat> there's, there's a couple of prereqs that have to be true before you can have like a strong relationship with a buyer and a seller. But I, I usually call this like the death of the salesperson's ego. You know, we know the feeling of, you know, that salesperson that is carrying themselves or asking you questions in a way where they almost, they feel like they're going to own the decision for you to work with them or not. And you almost don't want that salesperson to win. <laughs> and so you start like stonewalling them just because you're like, man, I, I'm seeing through your game here. You feel like you're going to be the reason that this closes. And I don't want to give you the satisfaction of like earning a deal on closing me today. <laughs> And that's usually when I go in like one word answer mode, when the salesperson still has this strong ego um, and hasn't earned my trust. And, and so prereqs, before you can have this be uh, like have the table set for a strong relationship with a buyer is they have to know that you're an, an authority in the space and that you don't care if they end up working with you or not working with you, that it's not really up to them to win you over or earn this deal. Because as soon as those elements get brought into the dynamic of a buyer-seller relationship, you're like chasing a buyer for the rest of time just to get them to trust you as an authority and an expert and not feel like you're letting them hit their sales quota or winning the, the day. You know what I mean? There's a way to ask a question that leads to the one word answer. And there's a way to ask a question that gets someone to want to respond. And there's there's this like, there's this moment when I'm asked this question as a buyer that you're trying to prevent them from creating the case against you. And you know it's not malicious, but you know that whatever you're saying is just formatting how the salesperson's gonna mold their pitch to say, well, you, you told me this. And you're like, you just used my words against me. And I'm, I'm not having that. So how do you do it? What's the difference between a good question and a bad question in that situation? Something that I focus on, and then Zach, I know you're going to have thoughts, is no yes or no answers can apply to the question that you're asking. Otherwise, you're likely leading them too much. And if it feels like it's canned questions that you're probably going to weaponize the answers that they're giving you in the second half of the sales call, chances are you do not have the dynamic of a trusting relationship with that person. And they feel like you're going through box checking mode or sales process mode and not genuinely caring about what's best for them in their, in their purchase. Yeah. Will said something really amazing a second ago, and actually it ties back to something we talked about in a much earlier episode about the guide test that we can do on our websites. And, and so there's this dynamic, which is if, if we think we're the hero, well, a hero in order to be a hero, there has to be a victim that they're saving. Right. Uh, and so when we try to act as hero in, 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 put too much regard on our own uh, ability to, to sell or you know whatever it might be. It comes across that we're treating them like a victim the way we ask the questions. Versus if you look at them, they want to be the hero right now. They want to be in the driver's seat. It's my job to be the guide to them as the hero, right? I'm Yoda. 
they're Luke Skywalker. We can argue about which one's better, but in reality, you know, Luke is the is the hero and is in need of a guide. And that's actually a very like that's a relationship of humility, which is like there's a there's a dependence on one another to to get the thing done. But nobody wants to be a victim. So in order though to to get to a point where you're asking great questions, there's something very important that you got to do. I'm just gonna blow everybody's mind here. You gotta practice asking better questions. And the only way to practice asking better questions in an environment where you're actually going to get better is by role-playing. This is the lost art for so many teams. I'm not even going to say sales teams, just any team that's doing communication. We've lost the art of role-playing. I mean, this, like you talk to, to people that have been around in sales for a long time. It's like, this used to be a thing. You used to do this a lot. It's very popular. And then somehow we just kind of lost our way on it and it didn't become important anymore. And if you ask an audience as to, you know, why is it uncomfortable or why do people not want to do it? They don't feel like it's real. They, um, you know, just don't feel like they get good feedback. It's just not valuable. So question though is, is it possible to create an environment in which it is very valuable and it does feel real? The answer to that, of course, is yes. And that's what we work on with a ton of our clients. In fact, I would argue it's one of the most valuable things we do for companies we work with. We help them develop a culture of role-playing so that they're always getting better. Whether they're working with us in the future or not, they're going to be continually getting better because they're practicing. There's, I've, I've, I've worked for plenty of companies that do role-playing and plenty that don't when I'm sitting in a sales seat. And there's a right and a wrong way to do it. Like you've, We've all role-played with someone where they're just giving it all away or they're stonewalling you. So how do you strike a balance between that and what an actual sales interaction is going to look like. We actually covered this. We have a great course in Impact Plus, which is uh, it's the art of role playing or something like that. And Chris Dupre and Marcus Sheridan, they actually lay out the different roles that, that, that show up in role playing, right? It's like that, that person that thinks it's just a big joke or that person that, is, you know, um, it's just stonewalling, like you said. And we actually, do, you have to do just as much training on how to show up in a role play as you do actually doing it, I think. And you have to maintain that. Um, so that's a great resource for anybody who's looking to do more of this. Um, what's also useful as well is, and I know we're going to talk about jolt selling today uh, in the jolt effect. It's useful also to understand what are the specific scenarios that you're going to end up in. And so for instance, as we talk about today, the inaction paradox, stuff like that, teasing a lot of great stuff we're going to talk about soon here. But let's role play, you know, somebody who feels like they don't have enough information, even though they clearly do. Let's role play someone who is just uncertain about what the outcome looks like and see where we go there. Let, so it's, you're giving it structure. It's not like, hey, sell me this pen, right? What's that movie? Um, uh, Wolf, Wolf of Wall Street, right? Sell me this pen. That's like a common thing. That's, that's actually not the great <laughs> environment to role play. We'd we'll be doing it based on real scenarios that we're actually going to find ourselves in and give it structure. There's, <clears throat> I think Chris has said this to me a hundred times, which is you don't, we salespeople find themselves practicing on real buyers versus practicing on each other. And that to me was the switch that flipped role playing from feeling like this weird, awkward thing to it's batting practice. Salespeople only get so many at bats. Right, We all know that the number of people that are looking to raise their hand to buy what you sell is going down just based on the, just the economics of today. It's just harder to get someone to want to do that thing. And so the fewer at-bats we have, the less practice we're going to get. And changing that mindset is saying the, the art of role-playing is more so about practicing on each other so that your pitch is airtight or your talk track, your line of questioning is airtight. I think that... that that seems like a huge, huge unlock for a lot of salespeople who are probably very apprehensive to want to even get involved in, in something like that. Yeah, it's a good mindset to share is that your batting practice, I mean, the closest thing you have to the real thing is the, the real thing itself. You role play so that you can recreate the real thing as best as you can. The other side of that is learning more from the at-bats that you have in the job. Um <clears throat> If companies are not reviewing sales calls together and just watching the game tape footage, 
at least something that we would do with a team that we we're just starting a, a culture of role playing with is bring us the call that was most ideal of the last two weeks. And we're going to pause it every time you ask a question. And before we hear the answer to that person, you say, did that help gain trust? Did that take away trust? Or did that do nothing to progress the conversation and strengthen the relationship? And you'd be surprised how often, first off, it's a great way to like build the list of questions that do gain trust when asked the right way. But second, it shows you how two salespeople could be having the same conversation with different levels of authority, different like soft skills to back up that conversation. They can ask the same question and it does a totally dramatically different impact on progressing the sales conversation. So that that's the lowest hanging fruit of all is like watch yourself on your old sales call recordings and share the the helpful and hurtful stuff with the rest of the team and discuss that. Bringing the calls to the team is a massive culture shift. This is something that it's hard to get people to want to do because there's it's mostly admitting, hey, this is where I screwed up or this is where I didn't, I don't think I did my best. What's, how do you encourage people to do that and create a space in the company that can thrive doing things like that? I'd be curious to, what, what do you say, Zach? This is actually really simple in my mind. In fact, I was talking with another coach about this earlier this morning. This, this comes down to the relationship within the team or the relationship between manager and rep. If they're not willing to share a call recording where they screwed something up, or if even in the recording, it's clear they're not really being themselves because they know it's a recording they're going to send, like that shows me there's a fundamental lack of trust between those two. I, um, even with my, I, I'd say I have a pretty confident uh, ego about myself. I share my worst calls with high level leaders here at Impact. And I'm proud to do it because it's like this this was a I totally screwed this one up and I know that they're going to help me get better. They're not going to judge me for making you know running a bad call. They're not going to uh, personally attack me or go put me on a performance plan. They're just going to look at it and go, "Okay, this is good." let's work on this. And I know I'm going to be better for it. So many teams don't have that type of cultures. You solve that though, as if it's just magical. I say it like it's just all, but if you do solve that, that will, uh, that will help this process tremendously. Yeah. And it's not something you can instill when you have a problem to go solve. Like I think most people want to start watching call recordings and role playing with their sales team when sales are dire or leads are are drying up. And then all of a sudden it becomes like more, the intention behind it is like micromanaging or fear-based decisions rather than growth oriented decisions for the company. And salespeople can see right through that. So that like the why behind now we're watching sales recording is because, uh, you know, company doesn't trust that what we're doing on these sales calls is our best work. And I think ideally the way a team is beginning work like this is not when there's a fire red alarm going off and when they can share wins as in the same light of like opportunities to get better. So most things we start with, we just have everybody bring their favorite three minutes of a call recording they've done. And then the three minutes that they, they know they needed to improve the most and share a win and share a loss and share why they think this is their best moment in sales for the week and their worst moment in sales for the week and discuss them both. All of a sudden then it's a broad spectrum of being praising publicly, critiquing publicly, starting that culture of calling out your best and your worst. So the foundation is built on, sounds like a couple of things. One is this, the principle or the culture of being able to focus on training. Like it all stems from that. It's like, if there's a, if there's not a culture where salespeople are looking for feedback or there's not a culture where people are comfortable doing those things, sharing call recording. So it starts there. Um, and then it's create the space where you can actually role play a specific scenario and not sell me this pen. I've fallen into a lot of situations, especially in past sales roles, where they're looking at you like, okay, I just walked in the door. S just do your thing. And it's like, I was working brick and mortar, selling stuff, selling tech. And there was like, all right, I just walked in the door. It's like, this is too broad. So dialing in on a specific moment is is a basic like r uh, play to run. So, and Will, this goes into... 
this goes into what we talked about on our like one one on one conversation last week that we up that went up on the podcast just about why deals end up in the lost the closed lost column and it falls into it, it i think there's a lot of communication principles that can prevent a lot of closed lost deals and one of the things that you pointed out was just this this idea of addressing using these communication principles to address fear, uncertainty, and doubt um, to prevent inaction. So what are those things? Yeah. So I'll, I'll start with the bucket of you're going to lose deals for two reasons. One is because they went with a substitute to yours, either a direct competitor, they found a solution that does the same thing, they're DIYing. But more likely in your space, you're losing to a person that or a company that doesn't know what they're going to do. They just aren't moving forward with you either consciously or like passively. And that's where folks have the biggest opportunity to grow their sales team is constantly having an ongoing discussion of what really causes inaction at the end of our sales process. What causes a company to not make some type of a purchasing decision? If they knew with the best intention of spending time and money and headspace on solving this problem two weeks ago when they reached out to us and up until this point now where they it's like going stale. I think that is one of the most important company or conversations that companies likely aren't having right now is why do we have an action like die on the vine so often? Um, Zach, when you're having a company start to discuss that for the first time, when they're thinking about like the reasons for inaction in their space, how do you how do you start to categorize that with companies? Yeah. Well, th this is the great news is that there are there are three major categories of indecision that happen. And I just want to reiterate what Will just said there. This is this is like I'm obsessed with this this uh indecision thing right now because the studies show us now that we've had the chance to, to record our sales calls and use AI to analyze all this stuff. I mean, the data that we have now from sales conversations is deeper than ever before. And they found that anywhere between 40 and 60% of deals end up in the no decision limbo. Imagine in your business, if you were closing between 40 and 60% more business, it would change everything. It would change everything for you. But we're not talking about it, right? We still think that we need to use these old principles of FUD, right? Fear, uncertainty, doubt. You, you just make them really discontent with the status quo. And that obviously, they're going to make a decision you know, to, to uh, get out of the status quo and do better. It's not the case. In fact, even when somebody says, I'm not content with what I have, where I'm at, whatever, over half of the time, they still don't make a decision. So it's not dialing up the fear, the uncertainty, the doubt. It's dealing with indecision. And, and what they found in analyzing all of these calls is there are three very common causes of indecision. In fact, these are like the three buckets. The first one was the feeling that, that the prospect didn't have enough information. Not that they didn't have enough information, but they didn't feel like they had enough information. Okay, so it's lack of information, first major cause of indecision. Second, is um, some sort of evaluation problem. So I want you to think about how this would show up in your sales process. When they say, um, you know what? I was actually looking at this other option. So how does that compare to what you have? And they're asking you that question like the late stage. And it's like, I didn't know you were looking at other things. They're introducing new things to evaluate, which is what's causing the indecision. So that's evaluation problems. Third is outcome uncertainty. In other words, they're having a problem in their mind seeing what the outcome is going to be. Whether or not you've done a good enough job of talking about it, they don't have certainty around the outcome yet. This is when, you know, if you're in B2B, this is when they start saying things like, can you show us some case studies? Have you worked with a client that's just like us? Uh, do you have anybody I can talk to? That is outcome uncertainty rearing its head. And you're thinking to yourself, we've already talked about all the details. Like, why do you need that stuff now? But they're dealing with outcome uncertainty. Now, to the degree that we can foresee these things coming up, that's where we can implement what, what's called the jolt effect. And I'm happy to go into that now, uh, Nick and Will, if you want to. Because 
it's 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 good to know these three things. We can role play these 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 three things, but Jolt J O L T is what Matthew Dixon and uh, Ted McKenna wrote about in their book called The Jolt Effect. And the first thing we got to do, the J is judge the indecision. Elite salespeople know how to judge indecision when they see it. So they they actually they will understand this is an out this is an outcome problem. This is a a lack of information problem. This is a valuation problem. They can say what it is and start to deal with it, right? So they can judge the indecision. The reason I say elite people do that is because those who aren't elite think, well, if I just turn up the fear, the uncertainty, the doubt, the whatever, really pick at that scab of the status quo for them, they're going to jump. That only contributes to the indecision. So the first thing we have to do is judge it. The second thing is that we have to offer a recommendation. So that's the O and Jolt. How many times have you been in a situation where you get to a point in the sales process, you might even ask the person, so what do you think I should do? Right? Like based on everything I've given you, like what would be a good option for me? You know, the most annoying response they could give back to you is, well, we've talked about a lot thus far. What do you think you should do next? We don't want to hear that. We want to actually get a recommendation. We want some jolt sellers know how to do this. They can actually say, based on everything, this is what I think you should do. This is what we've talked about, and this would be the, the best thing. The L in Jolt is a limiting exploration. So a Jolt seller understands how to not just sit there and, and uh, you know thumb through all the little details and stuff that doesn't matter. They're actually going to limit the amount of exploration. This is why Jolt sellers interrupt more than anybody. Isn't that funny how that works in sales? How the people who actually interrupt actually are more successful. And then the T uh, in uh, Jolt is to take risk off the table. Example of this would be dialing down the fear by saying something like we say at Impact, which is if at any time you don't get exactly what you feel you've paid for, we'll refund your money. Or you can just pay whatever you feel the value that you got. It's taking the risk out for them. That's Jolt. These, th- these are the things that we can actually role play and work on, which is what I love about them. I'm doing this with a ton of clients. This is haunting everybody. Um, and it's useful. It's very useful for us to work on our communication. The, the E stuck out to me because I remember it, when I was in a sales seat, there's this mode that you go into when people start pushing back where you just don't get enough, where it's hard pitch and you start giving a ton of extra information. And while you think if they just learn this thing, if they could just understand this one thing, then they'll understand why they should go with us. But in reality, you're giving them the wrong information and all it does is cloud the the whole decision-making process because now they have a whole ton of information that is probably not relevant but they're trying to figure out where it fits in this entire decision-making process. Michael had a really good question here. He said, do you give the recommendation before they ask this or wait for them to ask? And that was pertaining to, all right, you're already smiling at I encourage any of you to go read the book, but they talk about different types of people and the levels of decision, levels of indecision that they experience. So you've got what is a, a maximizer, and you've got, I forget the other term that they use, but it's basically somebody who, uh, they, they, they need a lot of information to make a decision. That's okay. That's okay to be that way. You need a lot of information, but you have to know who you're dealing with. So to Nick's example right there, you wouldn't want to give somebody who's having an outcome uncertainty issue. You wouldn't want to give them more information, right? That's the, that's the, that's what they don't need right now. They need less, they need clear. And so, uh, so Michael, to the, to the extent that we can dissect what typically happens in the buying process for so many of our buyers, where do they get stuck? Uh, where does indecision typically pop up? We want to deal with that through assignment selling, which of course we've talked about a bunch on the podcast, but essentially it's going back to self-discovery like we started this, this podcast. Wouldn't you want them saying, wow, I looked through all that content and I, and I have such a good idea of exactly what this is going to look like, right? Or you ask, or you ask them towards the end of the, of the sales process, so is there anything else you need to make a decision? They say, no, I feel like I've got it all. 
you've now you've dealt with the lack of information. So I think you have to foresee where this is going to show up in your industry and in your buying process. And you do want to get ahead of it as much as possible. The close loss analysis is probably the best place to go for that. Like go through your close loss deals, watch those calls, read those call notes. That's where you're going to find the bulk of what Zach is talking about here. Well, hey, we did this, we did this at Impact and we looked through a bunch of closed loss deals. And one of the most common things that kept popping up was timeline. Like it wasn't the right time. And, and, and I just know, like I could just guess that for so many of those people, it actually was the right time for them to start getting some coaching and to do the ask you answer. I just know in my heart, that's, that's got to be the case. But it's a convenient excuse, isn't it? Right? It's just not the right time. But in those, in those moments when it was the right time, were we dealing with the indecision properly? That's the question we should just always be asking ourselves, right? Is, was there something that I could have done to make the decision easier for them? And this is, by the way, we didn't talk about this, the inaction paradox. We have to understand our, for so many of our prospects, they're more afraid of making a wrong decision versus missing out on something. That's errors of omission versus errors of commission. In a B2B buying scenario, Okay, you're selling to a business, but a person has to make the decision. A person's going to sign it. Their fear of making the wrong decision and being judged by the rest of the team is greater than them missing out on what might be an awesome opportunity. That's self-protection. That's natural. We got to know we're going to deal with that. But that's the paradox of inaction. Even, even if they know something might be better, they're still going to be afraid that it could be the wrong thing. And we just have to know how to deal with that. And we have to give them permission to feel that way, by the way. We have to give them permission to, to feel concerned and worried that they might make the wrong decision. That's why I'm always telling people, express the fact that you don't want them to make the wrong decision. That's why you're giving them so much homework. That's why I give them so much content. Because I don't want you to make a bad decision. I want you to feel really informed. It's, it's like this idea. It's like how to help change when the change, when change is hard, right? It's so much easier to do nothing. It's like, so we have two, two B2B IT services here. And I think... Those are probably those are really easy industries to dive into, or that's a really easy industry to dive into because there's a lot of change that has to happen after you sign that requires a lot of attention and a lot of effort. Or typically, some people might think that. I don't know if that's true in your businesses, guys. But the idea is that. So Zach, to your point, the idea is that timeline oh it's just not the right time for us to invest all this effort here and they're going to go no decision so how do you combat that like let's dive into that specific business type and that specific industry because we've worked with um b2b it companies we were with a few of them like how do you dive into that a little bit oh gosh well i mean i think a specific example here is like when is the right time to change uh, the the provider or change the consultant or change whatever it seems to me like in some industries people are just bouncing around between providers all the time or it could be they don't make a change often at all and they would prefer not to. I just want to know this is going to be taken care of in my business. I don't want to spend a bunch of time on it. And I definitely don't want to have to do this again. So coming right out and saying uh, uh, things like that and realizing that the worst thing that you can hear isn't no, it's I need time to think about this. So how do you in a non-forcefully way because I'm, what I'm definitely not suggesting is we'll just speed things up and just make, force them to make a decision. What I'm saying is, what would, in a B2B IT scenario, what would that person who's going to be the most afraid of making the mistake, what do they need to show the rest of the team they've done all their due diligence, and even if it turns out bad, it wasn't their fault? Try that on for size. That's what I think. It's like, now you, you have a, you know, a buying group within an organization. It's like you're arming your point of contact with all the stuff that everybody needs to say, well, we're, we're, we're being thorough here. We're using good logic here. We know we're making a, a, a sound decision. That's what I would say, especially in that space. Yeah. <clears throat> thinking about impacts, thinking about our like closed loss analysis, I think a common thread that we had was we had a, fir a, a great beginning of our sales process. And we would usually get someone to like the 60% of the way done buying mark. And then the path of how to finish the purchase or the buying decision for them felt pretty like cloudy. They weren't, they weren't sure all the information they were going to need. They weren't sure who needed thumbs up on their end. And it just became like 
open-ended and they weren't sure if it was up to us or up to them on who's calling the shots of how we finish this buying process the right way as a company. And this is where, this is where I think a lot of B2B places dies. Like they have a great demo call, a great feature benefit pitch, but they don't do a good job at allowing someone to follow through on finishing the purchase decision for their company. Um, you said something that's important, which is like, somebody's going to be betting on this horse in your organization. And this decision is either going to make them look good or make them look bad in the coming months. And likely, and that's probably what they're thinking about more. They're thinking about like, am I going to look like a hero in my company when I introduce this to them? Or is this going to not affect my level of authority at the business? Or could this po possibly like harm my reputation in some way? So what we had to do at Impact was help people see the end of the road, like the five things they should be considering at this stage in our purchasing decision. These are the five questions you got to be having a conversation on internally. This is the only five. So don't feel like you have to go find six, seven, and eight. Like these are the things you have to get agreement on today. So at least they felt like there was a well-beaten path for them to go execute a process more than be left with all of their thoughts and questions, fears, worries, and concerns, and just been like demanding social proof or more information from us when they didn't know what else they needed to feel confident in their purchasing decision. Yeah, there's like a there's an element of getting a, a deal to a stage to say it's there, to say it's, hey, this this deal is at this, they've made this much progress. This is what my pipeline looks like, especially when times are tough. And, and you, you and I talked about this last week, right? There's this, when we base our sales process on arbitrary stages, okay, we did the explore call. Okay, we did the discovery call. Okay, we did a feature, a feature and a pitch call. Okay, you technically, yeah, and based on that logic, they are in stage four. And, but in reality, we never got a decision maker involved. And so now all of a sudden, we don't know what their criteria is to actually invest in this. So, and you're both saying, saying this in different ways, but it's what decisions need to be made in order to actually purchase the thing that we sell and making sure the buyers very well of the decisions that they need to make. Because if we don't make that crystal clear for them, they're going to just start pulling in decisions that are, may or may not be relevant. Yeah. We, um, for anyone who's read Baseline Selling by Dave Curlin, would recommend that you, that you pick that up. It's actually something that we've, I've been teaching to clients uh, a lot lately because what I've noticed is that in many sales processes, because we don't look at, at them as a buying process, we look at it as our sales process. We tend to run across the infield. In other words, if you take what you know about the game of baseball, you know, you can't run from first to third, right? You can't do that. Uh, you got to run the bases in order. And what uh, Dave Curlin has put together with baseline selling is like, you need to really map that buying process out into something like a baseball diamond where you have to go to the next base. You don't, don't move on until you've, until you've covered that thing. For us, what it really helped us discover is like, okay, with that as well, what are the decisions people need to make along the way? Because for instance, if we hear at impact, we, uh, try to try to sell a coaching service before we've really um before we've really helped somebody make a decision that I really do want to take my sales and marketing in house our our ability to prescribe coaching services is unfounded if they have no interest in taking their stuff in house what do they need the coaching for even if we could sell it why would we like you still have that, that was a that was a decision point that had to happen way early on way earlier on they had to say, I want to take my sales and marketing in-house. Now, if you apply this to your own sales process, there's a sequential order of decisions that somebody needs to make. The first decision for your customer might be, I'm not content with the status quo right now. I'm not content with my current provider. I'm not content with the current service. I'm not content with the current product that I have, whatever. That's the first decision that they have to make because go try to pitch something to somebody who is happy with what they've got. It's a lot tougher. And that is to say, we need to be able to think about what Will said, what decisions do people have to make and know it's our job to get them through those decisions, not just to sell them something. If you get to the point of selling, it's wonderful, but you're helping them make decisions along the way.
Yeah. It's like a sequence of agreements that has to happen in roughly like the same order every time. And to Nick's point, like you can, you can hit all those agreements on the first call you have with someone, or you could be through three calls and only hit the first two agreements still. It has nothing to do with like the mentality you might be stuck in on. I do these three calls and then the deal either closes or I get ghosted. So to, to bring this back to the uh, example, Nick, you and I were talking about, this company had <clears throat> 50 demo calls a month, and that was the the number they were hanging their hat on. But they would have that demo call with anyone and their mother that would just attend that had a heart rate. And so they would typically have an information gatherer come there and say, oh, this sounds great. Thanks for the future benefit dump. I'm going to go do my best to play the game of telephone and share this valuable info with my company leaders. And then we're going to have a super productive 30 minute meeting and decide on this wrong. That's never what happens. We have to assume that your information gatherers are likely poor communicators and don't remember 90% of what you shared with them in this call. So you have to find a way to like, I think the question that we ask them is like, how do we retain as much control of how a company makes a decision about working with us or not? And how do we make it as easy on them as possible to just keep their brain turned off and follow a process rather than do whatever they do if like left to their own devices, which is likely a 30 minute meeting and led to no decision. And then that information gatherer is afraid to hang their hat on any of the, the potential sellers hats because they don't want to look like an idiot. And they kick this 90 days and start the whole process over again and like have the goldfish buying mentality. So what we did for that team was like, let's tell them the five things they should be considering right now and then help them even schedule an internal meeting for them to have that conversation. And two weeks later, we'll have an FAQ of what, what shook from that just to like try and dig in a little more and making sure that information gatherer is actually going to take action when they walk away from this demo call that we're patting ourselves on the back for. That's, that's what I think like my biggest takeaway from the jolt effect was, was like, how do we retain control of what the rest of the buying process looks like after we've had our typical last call with someone before the ghosting starts? <laughs> the ghosting starts. It's inevitable. So there's, you're, you were working with this B2B benefits tech company. So, and there's an ed tech B2B company here. So it, it's, I think there will be some similarities here in terms of like the way that someone ends up buying that. You said that they come in, there's an information gatherer or just like an overall champion or someone in the company recognizes there's a need for this. And they're looking to create a case to get a decision maker involved to make the investment, right? To make a commitment to change. But they were rated on demos as a company. So they would give demos to anyone with a pulse, like you said. So there's a frustration in B2B tech too, that is you're never given the demo on the first call. There's like a big problem in B2B, in B2B tech sales. When you book a call, no matter how qualified you are, they like they really withhold the demo. What you're suggesting isn't withholding the demo, but it's like, how do you augment that type of sales process? What is it? How do you communicate that? How do you set that up so that you give them what they asked for, but you're also not wasting a whole ton of time? Yeah. It's how do you, assuming you have the, the worst information gatherer in the world from a communication standpoint, how do you set that person up for success to bring this content back to their team and allow their team to make a buying decision in some ways and not have this just die on the vine like it likely will if there's not some sort of like getting in the boat with you and helping you make this this decision. It's a similar problem to what Impact has. Yeah, I think it's um, it's a buying guide type of uh, material that you're not just helping them buy your solution, but you're helping them find a solution that is good for them. You know, and I even find that with a lot of demos, they're never going to bring up another option, right? Like th they're pretty much going to do the demo is like, this is what all the great features and things, this is, that's pitching. That's feature dumping. That's feature dumping, like illustrated. That's literally what you're doing is you're showing features. Self-discovery, you can actually do very well on a demo, I found. So have you looked at any other tools that do this particular thing? Or this that feature one feature I just showed you, do you see yourself using something like this or does, is it not really important to you? Now those might be questions that need to be refined, but you are getting them to think. That's part of the problem is that with demos, we think 
we think logic works like a fax machine going from our brain into somebody else's brain. They're just getting it. This is not how it goes. It's not how it goes at all. So what Will's saying is really, you're taking a step back. You're thinking higher level. It's, here's all the decisions you're going to have to make, the things you're going to need to do as this, this buying agent for this company. Go have these meetings, brainstorm this, get this person sign off on that. Bah, 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 bah. You're helping them through the buying process. Um, they're going to want to buy your stuff because you're making it easy to buy. That's what we say this all the time, right? Selling a way that people want to buy. Teaching a way they want to learn too. But even if you don't, even if you're not the best teacher, be the best seller. Be the one that makes it just really incredibly easy to buy. And they're going to buy it from you because you made it easy. There's like a buying process architecture here that should also be a fundamental change in the way that most businesses go to market, which when we put ourselves in these bad situations to make the demo the thing, because it puts the salesperson in the back seat to the and it forces them to rely on features and pitching right from the jump because now they have to the buyers in is looking at it through this lens i need to see the product i need to see the features i need to be able to click around i need to be able to do these things versus if they saw it on the website if they were to do a live walkthrough so they could watch a video walkthrough on your website now the first sales interaction is not about features and pitching and trying to prove that your product is better, faster, smarter, whatever than the other guys. Now it's about solving problems. I actually say it's less about getting in the backseat, Nick. And I say it's more about being like one of those driver's ed teachers that sits in the passenger seat and they have a brake so that everybody doesn't die. That's more what it's like, right? They know how to turn the brakes on, like control the vehicle. They might even have a wheel in front of them, but you're driving the car still, right? That's pr- perhaps a really good illustration of what this should, should look like in practice. Yeah, for sure. It, it 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 reshapes the nature of the sales conversation from the very first interaction. All right, guys, you know how we do this. We end every we end every show. We land this plane, and we talk about how to think different. So, Will, I want to go to you first. Everything we went through today, what sh- what should someone walk away with, and how should they think different? There's a broader topic today. So I'm going to come back down to the action items I would do as a company owner right now. Um, The goal is for your sales folks to be trusted advisors and be amazing at asking questions and leading folks to make their own decisions. The best way for you to get started on doing that is do a close loss analysis. What are the deals that ended up not buying from you in the last three months or six months, depending on how many you have there and unpack the ones that you know ended up not doing anything at all. I would start by just watching those call recordings or looking at transcripts of that and writing down all of the questions that we're asking in our sales process today and then building the list of what agreements have to be made throughout our sales process and when are we getting to those in our current conversations. If you have that, you at least have easy, low hanging fruit for you to start having discussions or role plays with the folks that are customer or lead facing in your company. And ideally you have less things dying on the vine of inaction after an exercise like this. I'm still waiting for HubSpot to add the uh, low hanging fruit button to my portal, but <laughs> I'm, I'm it's a coming. A marketer can G- dream. GPT six. <laughs> Seriously. All right, Zach, how to think different. I'm gonna keep mine short and sweet. If you want to ask better questions, audit the purpose and progress. This is a principle. It's a timeless principle. If you want to look at how your team is doing or how you yourself are doing with asking questions that cause people to, to self-discover things, ask yourself, does it have a purpose? Does it show progress? That's a principle. We'll always apply. Principles are timeless. Love it, guys. This is always, these are always fun. And I can't wait for next week. So thank you, everyone for joining us today. As always, you can catch the replays, the guest appearances, the other great shows, and all the other exclusives on the But We're Different podcast feed or YouTube channel. And we will be back next week, Tuesday at 3 p.m. with another episode of But We're Different Live. And we hope to see you there. Thanks, everyone.